We now present to you Princess Ember. Oh, wait. Uh, this episode's going to be confusing to talk about, isn't it? Just a tad. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. The pony, not the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, Season 6, Episode 5, Gauntlet of Fire. Hmm, Harry Potter take? Goblet of Fire? Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, new character, Princess Ember of the Dragon Kingdom, who, spoilers, not that it really matters, <laughs> <laughs> becomes Lord Fire- I almost said Lord Fire Ember? I was like, that's kind of redundant. <laughs> Just a tad. When she becomes Lord Ember. So, as I said, it's going to be interesting talking about this. So I say we just go by Princess or Lord Ember. What do you think? Well, no, that'll just make it more confusing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Keeping snarky comment to self. <laughs> uh, what do you want to say? No, call me those things. I was going to say, well, in the MLP universe, I would prefer to go by Princess. It has more status. <laughs> so I actually, when I first watched this episode, I something bugged me about it, and I couldn't figure out what it is, so I watched it the second time, and nothing really bugged me about it, and I think it was just the environment, because I was actually watching it on my phone, I had to stop, I had to pause it frequently at certain parts to have to go and do something else while I was taking care of some errands, so I was like, oh, I need to manage my time layer, so I'll just download this episode and watch it on my phone, and I kept getting interrupted, so I'm thinking it was the interruptions that were annoying me more than the episode. Oh, I did enjoy this episode, but at the same time, I'm going to absolutely shred it apart. <laughs> also, another thing that kind of bugged me, and I'm not quite sure why it bugged me at first, I think it's because people just like slapping labels on things, and I was like, don't! label her like that and then I realized oh it's because they were just doing it because of the simple reasons of labeling her a Sundari. I think it's because I'm so used to Sundaris being very shallow characters who are only mm, I don't love you I don't understand that I love you because that's the way I'm written not because they have cultural reasons to be that way like Ember she actually has cultural reasons to not show emotions to other people this is why she keeps denying it, because to her, it's kind of a culture shock of, wait, you can show emotions to others? That's so strange. So of course she would have that kind of reaction. So she's actually a more well-rounded sundere than most anime sundere who are just that way because the script said so. <laughs> so that's my little thing on that. And I think that's why I was bugging it, because people just took the basic trait and said, this is it. And I was like, oh, she's actually a really good sundere, though. And one of the funniest parts to me is when Spike finally gets the scepter and goes... On your long trip home, you have to hug everyone and not explain why. <laughs> but you see, that happened in front of, you know, I'm just going to use the word dragon every time, dragon ember. <laughs> <laughs> and so she has both heard the term hug and seen one demonstrated. So she should not be so shocked when Spike hugs her. I was just about to hand you over to do your nitpicks. <laughs> Well, I figured I'd start where you were, but I'm going to go back to what is it about the MLP universe where only ponies are decent creatures? <laughs> Every time we go to another culture, they are jerks as a culture. <laughs> the Griffins are interested in nothing but money. The Yaks are raging bullies. And now we are this at least the third episodes with dragons, and we have established that dragons as a culture are bullies and don't do friendship, and apparently like picking on ponies. So why haven't more ponies been picked on if that's the case? Also, if the Dragon Lord Torch was summoning so many dragons to compete to become the new Dragon Lord, where were the adult dragons? These, as established in the Great Dragon Migration episode, are pretty much all juvenile dragons. And even Dragon Princess Ember isn't that much smaller than Garble. 
who has been previously identified as a juvenile dragon. The adult dragons are much larger, both as seen in the Great Dragon Migration and in Dragonshy. Where was that red dragon from Dragonshy? You know, if the Dragon Lord Torch was looking for big, strong dragons to compete, why are we having nothing but teenagers? This isn't Power Rangers. <laughs> Another quick little note on Princess Ember, or Dragon Ember. She was actually voiced by uh, another person who doesn't seem to have much voice credits to her name. She's actually a singer-songwriter, and from what I can tell, hasn't done any other voice work other than this episode of My Little Pony. Seems kind of interesting how they're slowly picking up singer-songwriters as voice actresses. Well, it makes sense for MLP because so many of the episodes incorporate music. So if you get people who are known to have singing ability and incorporate them as voice actors, then you can have the same voice actor for both the singing and spoken voice. Unless there's some type of conflict with scheduling, which is the reason Tara Strong and I think Rarity, uh, Rarity may do her own singing voice, but Tara Strong has a separate singing voice because she's actually in a different location compared to everyone else who does voice work for the show. And continuing in my nitpick of Ember's n Dragon Ember is not that much smaller than Garble, so truly why is her father barring her other than the I am the overprotective father for no reason? And if the Dragon Lord is traditionally a big, strong dragon, why was the staff that small? That makes absolutely no sense because once again, this episode was mostly juvenile dragons and the proper size of a staff for an adult dragon would have been much larger. I didn't even think of that point you brought up about the fact that there are no adult dragons there. That kind of just hit me. So, so if it summons all dragons... They didn't say all dragons. They said that the glowing occurs when the dragon lord summons a dragon. So why would the dragon lord only summon adolescents? Especially considering a matter of succession which apparently in dragon culture is not linear. And the status of being princess actually apparently has no status. Unlike in Ponydom, where princess is the highest rank. Hmm, good point there. <laughs> and I like how we neatly sidestepped the question of how Twilight and Rarity were actually keeping up with all the dragons. Because Dragon Ember asked that question and then, oh look, a distraction! Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, how did they? I like how she's like, so how did you? Oh, distraction. Never mind. And how do we truly know this little about dragons? Because historically, ponies have watched the Great Dragon Migration, so there's at least been observation at a distance. And Fluttershy's ability to deal with the dragon from the episode Dragon Shy proves that there can be communication between ponies and dragons. And if that little is known about dragons by ponies as a whole, why on earth was Twilight ever given a dragon egg to hatch as part of her entrance exam? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I do hope since they seem to be exploring more lore outside of ponydom, they also explain where Spike's egg came from, like what's important about it, why is it like... Uh, not important, because if you think about it, it's not really that important because they give it to her as a test. So that egg wasn't, you know, that high up there on importance. Because if it was a gift from an ambassador to help with a peace treaty or something, they wouldn't do that. Right. And no attempt was ever made to return Spike to the dragon, so apparently that wasn't seen as important to reunite a hatchling with its biological parents. So did Celestia just find an abandoned clutch of eggs? That still brings up the question of why was the egg used as a test? Did it, like maybe they didn't expect it to actually hatch into a dragon? <laughs> yes, but if they didn't know it was a dragon egg, then why let this young student keep it after it hatches and proves to be a dragon? And now back to the actual episode. <laughs> well, we like asking questions of that universe. It's one of our favorite hobbies. <laughs> yes. So, going back to the very beginning of the episode, Rarity, you're harvesting gems, and you brought one 
wicker bowl. You at least bring a basket with a handle, a little easier to carry. Oh, I don't know, a cart, like from the Diamond Dogs episode, so that you can actually harvest more than a handful. And that reminds me of something else in this episode. This episode apparently verbally confirms that unicorn magic is visible. The glow around objects is visible because Rarity off the hand it says, this is one of the times I wish unicorn magic wasn't so luminescent. Yes, so we now have confirmation that no, this is not just a trick to show the audience that unicorn magic is in use, it is fully visible. And not just fully visible to other unicorns, fully visible period, because the bats are not sentient creatures, as far as we know. Because if they were, she would have taken Fluttershy along and talked to them and go, oh, excuse us while, you know, we harvest these gems, I hope you don't mind. Actually, she should have taken Fluttershy and done that anyways, since she was so worried about getting bats in her hair. Especially since Fluttershy would have been able to communicate with them anyways. Yes. Also, this is, I think, the first episode where harvested gems are not perfectly faceted gemstones. While they are still faceted and sparkly, they did not have the cut forms that we normally see in the MLP episodes that would never ever happen in a million years in the real world. I love it when you nitpick stuff. It's grand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then, you know, in a way the whole episode was disappointing because we cut back to Twilight's castle and there are Celestia and Luna and it's a quiet moment. We could actually have some discussion and some banter and some relationship building. But no, they had to utter that magic phrase of yeah usually there's some sort of crisis going on so we don't have any free time and boom there's a crisis and we don't have any free time except apparently the princesses still have the higher tiered princesses still have free time because they don't go along on this trip and apparently princess twilight also had free time because she was able to leave her castle even though she's a princess with responsibilities to go tag along, and let's not forget that that means she is leaving her student behind, because Twilight is now a teacher. Maybe uh, this shows that Starlight Glimmer has a life outside of studies, like Twilight didn't. <laughs> entirely possible. Also, Twilight was entirely too excited about this whole opportunity to observe dragon culture thing. It's nothing like how she was acting when they followed Spike during the Great Dragon Migration. She had plenty of time to observe while they were impersonating a dragon and right there watching dragon culture in action. Kind of funny how this episode's a combination of continuity and let's break a little continuity because <laughs> they have the mention of the costume they wore last time and I love Twilight. It's more practical. Yeah, rocks don't move though. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, that's great for, you know, observation, but it doesn't really let you move around. But at the same time, the crackle costume would have been a bad idea because it wouldn't have been glowing. So it would have been very clear that they were not summoned. The Dragon Lord would not recognize who they were. And any attention to crackle from the Dragon Lord and their cover would have been blown in front of an entire group of adolescent dragons who would try to tear them to bits. Because all dragons apparently are jerks. I am seriously wounded here. For the universes in which I am a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, neither of us are jerks. In the universes where we're dragons. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I, though this also brings up the point that if all the dragons are hostile towards ponies... I'm guessing Torch actually isn't that hostile towards ponies because he hasn't sent his dragons off to hassle the ponies. So I'm thinking he has some type of agreement with Celestia, or at least knows Celestia enough to like, yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but we also have some name issues in terms of the lands, because they refer to the pony lands and the dragon lands, but the dragons also refer to Equestria as a whole, as in the entire planet's called Equestria. And also Equestria in a smaller sense of Equestria only being the pony-held lands. Hmm. So, any more nitpicks? Any more nitpicks, he asks. I warned you that I was going to tear this episode apart. Proceed. 
All right, when Spike first rescues Dragon Ember, she is still wearing her helmet. At no point does she put the helmet back on once her identity has been revealed to Spike. Okay, she's out of sight of her father, but this is still an incredibly dangerous thing. I could see actually leaving the helmet off when they're flying past the flying the boulders because the helmet would restrict peripheral vision, but it's a helmet. It protects your skull. Logically, it should have gone back on. And it's her disguise. Yes, because in front of all the dragon competitors, she was told by her father that she would not be competing. And also, am I remembering correctly that Spike had a near fall into lava that was considered dangerous? It's dangerous for ponies, not for dragons. Well, the near fall was actually into, um, I can't remember which, but they were either stalagmites or stalactites. Basically, Spike's coming off the floor is what he was falling towards. Okay, that would be painful, and that would be painful to a dragon. Mm-hmm. Especially one as small and probably a little less thick-skinned than other dragons. Because <laughs> apparently the nicer you are, the smaller and less capable you are. <laughs> yes, that was another dragon episode that I disliked. That we established that all dragons are horribly greedy creatures. God, I haven't even touched on that yet in this episode. So we have made out the dragons to be bullies, um, disdainful of friendship, hating ponies, and, oh yes, ridiculously greedy. And that last one ties back to the griffins. So apparently in the MLP universe, you are either a pony or you are a jerk. <laughs> well, to be a little bit fair here, there are a lot of pony jerks. <laughs> Yes, but the non-jerks in the non-pony races seem to be limited to one or two characters showing a change of heart during the episode. I think Princess Amber was already nice. It's just in her culture, nice isn't something you show, so she's learned to hide it very well. And then she encountered Spike, and Spike showed her that, oh, it's perfectly okay to show this, so she started to show it to him because she understood that he would appreciate it. Also that he would not make fun of her for it, because it was demonstrated very clearly by her standing up for him at the very beginning. It was like, come on, Dad, he's little and he doesn't want to compete. Do you really want someone trying to win the position of Dragon Lord that doesn't even want to be Dragon Lord? So now my question for you, did you predict the ending, that Spike would win and would give it up to somebody else, specifically Ember once we got to know her? At the beginning, I was actually thinking that it would either be Amber or Spike, or that Spike would win, then hand it over to Amber. I pretty much had that in my head from the start, because I was like, oh, we're pointing out this character. She's important. Yeah, she's either going to become it, or Spike's going to become it, and then hand it over to her, or we're going to find out some other kind of cliche reason that he can get to leave and go back to Pony World. <laughs> yes. But you see, it was more important for the story... For Spike to win and give over the power to Ember because that's showing one more lesson that he doesn't covet the power. He was only trying to protect his friends. And through the course of this task, Spike learned that he could trust Dragon Ember. And so not only does he believe in her ability to lead, he believes that she will protect his pony friends because she's already done so. Oh, and here's something we should point out. This is a Spike episode, and it's good. I was saving that for final thoughts. <laughs> when we get to that point, I can explain to you why I think it's a good Spike episode. <laughs> Let me see, I think I should go over that now. <laughs> oh, I was about to call it quits on the nitpicking. I just had to finish up with the costumes and the notebook. So, yeah, their disguises were actually pretty good, just impractical for mobility. They were really only good for standing still and observing. They were not good for mobility. I like the touch that Rarity was inspired by this adventure to come up with yet another new clothing line. I hope it's a little easier to move around in than their actual disguises. And Twilight is still way, way, way too excited about all the stuff on dragon culture. I mean, 
her reaction in the beginning when everyone's giving her that look in the castle like, really, Twilight? The notes that she's writing and that silliness with the quill tickling Rarity's nose and the thing at the end where, yay, I get to write Dragon Lord Ember and ask all my dragon culture questions. I'm like, yeah, Dragon Lord Ember is going to wish that she could do a return to sender on those because she's going to get letters constantly. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It's like, yeah, she shouldn't have said that. She definitely shouldn't have said that because she is going to get questions on an hourly basis until she goes, Twilight, please stop. <laughs> Either that or we can have Twilight come back as an ambassador to actually make an alliance with the dragons by acting in her capacity as Princess of Friendship and Ember acting in her capacity as Dragon Lord. Or can we change that phrasing from Dragon Lord to Lord of Dragons and play the summoning flute and get three blue eyes white dragons on the field? <laughs> uh, so yeah, shall I move on to why it's a good Spike episode? Yes. Because Spike wasn't the main focus. <laughs> Even though it was a spec episode, he was assisting Ember in learning how to show that she's actually nice without having to be embarrassed by it because of her culture saying that it's not good to show nice emotions. So he was an assistant still. He was technically secondary in his own episode, which makes it a good spec episode because every time we strictly focus on Spike, it becomes a problem because they have to make him into the problem. So we don't like him because he's the problem. <laughs> Or this time, not only was he not the problem, he was the hero of the episode. He saved Dragon Ember's life. He teamed up with her and defended her throughout the episode. Not that she didn't also defend him. He won the coveted prize and gave it up to one better suited to rule. So it shows Spike at his best, which is helping other people instead of showing his bad side, which is what they usually do in episodes that focus strictly on him. Yes, like Princess Spike, please no more like that ever again. <laughs> and this also shows how much he has learned from that episode, because he abused power and took power he did not have in this episode. And now in an episode, he rightfully earned power and gave it away because he only had one purpose in pursuing it. So this really shows that he's learned not to feel overshadowed by others and to be confident in his own gifts and abilities. So, does that wrap up everything? Yes, because otherwise I'll just nitpick for the next hour and a half. And if <laughs> you guys really want to hear that, tell me and we'll do a second recording. <laughs> well, I enjoyed the episode. I really enjoyed certain parts of it, like, I said before the, on your way home, you must hug everyone and not tell them why. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's so embarrassing. What the heck are you doing? I can't tell you. <laughs> no, the best part of that was that the first dragon that Garble hugged smiled and was happy about it. Mm-hmm. That's the reason that's so funny to me. It's like, wow, that's a good one, Spike. I like what you did there, because it's a punishment without being a punishment. It's great. Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, I enjoyed the episode, especially with a second viewing where I could watch all the way through without interruptions. <sighs> oh, yes. A good Spike episode, finally. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoyed it. And this has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 6, Episode 5, Gauntlet of Fire. Thanks for listening. If you want to be notified of new episodes, please subscribe. I would really enjoy that and it would encourage us to continue to do more episodes. If you like my art, you can find me on Tumblr and DeviantArt. Or if you want to support me, you can go to my Patreon or check the link for commission availability.